If you want to follow along, you're probably best to stay in Ephesians chapter six. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, armor of God, but I'm going to be talking about all kinds of other things. So if you want to follow along, speed up your ears. Matthew chapter 24, verse four to eight. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to, I'll just, I just want to read it. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars, rumors of wars. See, you're not frightened for those things must take place, but that's not the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, various places. There will be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely a beginning of birth pains. Yeah, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, you know, all oh, there's storms in the world's collapsing. There's wars happening everywhere. You got the Ukrainian war and now you've got this war happening over in Israel. And that's the thing I want to talk about this morning is the war happening over in Israel. Too many are saying this war in Israel might start the Armageddon, a holy war to end it all. And so many people are trying to say, it's a holy war. God's got his hand in on it. This is the thing you need to divorce yourself from. People who say such things need to be turned to, into, no, turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 20, Matthew chapter 22, 29. Talking to the Sadducees, he says, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. They need to study more. You need to study more if this is the way you're thinking that there's a holy war breaking out. Armageddon, if you truly understand Revelation, Armageddon has already taken place. No. We are living in a thousand years. Oh, but it's been more than two thousand years is simply symbolic. If you go to the book of Revelation, which is a little bit complicated, but not impossible to understand. It's more about the Roman Empire uh, going after the church, which God allowed. We're living in a thousand years. There's no more persecution coming after the church yeah. as we see in the Roman Empire. The next event in history is the coming of Christ. The next event is called Judgment Day. There's no thousand years and another opportunity. We're living in the end. But we're not living in end times. That's what happened back then. We're living in the thousands. Yet so many wars are blamed on God and blamed on religion, but they're not. They're false claims. You know, a few people, he's okay. A few people, uh, Juan, you just got me off track here. Thank you very much. False claims. Too many people are trying to put the blame on God. Well, no. Oh, yeah, but what about the Crusades? Well, that was the Pope. I'm sorry, that's not the church. It's Catholicism. You know, it's it's greedy men who have created things. It's greedy men that create these things called wars. But don't get me wrong. I believe Hamas is a terrorist group. And what we saw was a terrorist attack that needs to be dealt with. Don't call it a holy war. Okay? Just don't call it a holy war. And somebody out there, aha, uh -huh, needs to be muted. That's okay. A little history on the Jewish nation before people call this a holy war. You got to have this history down. That means you have to do memory work. You know, I know. That's the one word. Somebody's got to teach me. Don't, Jeff's always tell me, don't say the word memory, because once you say the word memory, people who, and everybody has come through school. Remember when the teacher said memory work? Uh, that's it. I'm out of here. No, you've got to, you got to put the word of God in your heart. Don't call it memory work, call it whatever you will. But it's, it, you've got to implant it because this is what saves you. In 971, King Solomon took his seat upon the throne. And by 931, 40 years later, he had led Israel into full-blown idolatry with idols up in the temple itself. Thanks to his 600 wives, oh yeah, and 300 concubines, he had led Israel totally astray. Everybody blames Rehoboam 
for the split in 931. But it wasn't Rehoboam's fault. They just had enough of his dad. They don't want any more of this nonsense, this idolatry. So the 10 northern tribes split away and they created their own religion and they created their own idols, right? Well, God's not into that. So 722 BC, God sends Assyria in and destroys the 10 northern tribes. Why? Because they had gone away from God and into idolatry. In 606, 596, 586, God sends Babylon in, takes Judah off the land, but leaves prophecies saying, you're going to be taken off the land, especially in Jeremiah, for 70 years, and then I'm going to bring you back. But because of your idolatry, and you have to learn to get away from idolatry, they'd even made the temple idolatrous. They need to get back to what? The word of God. That's what Daniel teaches. Got to get back to the word of God. So 536, 70 years later, Ezra, as promised, heads back. Well, actually, it's Zerubbabel being sent by Cyrus, and they rebuild the temple. In 444, they rebuild... Um, the walls, and they're back at it again. But then after Jesus' time in, in 70 AD, the Romans, well, the Romans show up in 67 AD, 70 AD, God finally has had enough of the Jews. Rome destroys Jerusalem, takes the temple, drags it off the hill, drops it off a cliff, right? All of this is prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and it's actually, it's in, it's interesting when you read Deuteronomy chapter 8, he's saying it like in 64, I'm going to scatter you. And he's talk, talking about this when the Romans take over, right? He's talking about the view all over the world. You, sh you shall find no rest. You will have a trembling heart, fall failing of eyes, despair of soul. Your life will hang in doubt, dread at night, no assurance of your life. The Lord will bring you back to Egypt, meaning I'm going to take you right back into captivity. You will never see it again. You're never going to see the promised land again. You're never going to see the freedom. Don't understand it in a physical. You have to understand it in a spiritual. You will offer yourselves for sale, but there will be no buyer. That's the last word in 28. Nobody wanted the Jews in World War II. Even Canada turned the ships around and says, we don't want you. You go back to Germany. The United States turned the ships around, sent them right back. Nobody wanted them. As a matter of fact, in 1947, after the war, they said, nobody wants them. So let's just send them to Palestine. And that's what they did. A man-made action, and it's called a man-made tragedy. You have to have compassion for the Palestinians who lived there for the last 1400 years. Oh, but God gave them the land. No, God gave them the land in 1400 BC, but in 70 AD, he took them off the land and said, never again. He had to destroy the temple. He destroyed their, their way of getting their sins forgiven. No more animal sacrifices. He should destroy it all. Why? Christ came to put the whole Testament behind us to establish one people, God's people, which are Christians. The Jews don't have a relationship with God. That's the thing you need to understand. So whatever is going on over there now, it's government, right? That's what it is. Yes, they need our prayers, as do the innocent women and children of the Gaza Strip need our prayers. It's just, it's a, it's a zoo. Israel's not a country of God's people. God's people don't have a country. We don't have a country. Our citizenship is, it's up in heaven. That's our citizenship. We come from every nation, every language, every race. A few interesting stats. Christianity is 2.5 billion people in this world. 32% of the world follows Christianity. 32%, 24% follow Islam. Here's one that'll rock you. The next biggest population is atheists, 1.2 billion, 16% of the world's population. Hinduism is 15%. So the top three religions in the world is Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism. Buddhists, 7%. Chinese, 6%. 
the Sikhs, 0.3%. I haven't mentioned the Jews, have I? God's people, 0.2%, less than 14 million, claim to be Jewish in this world today. Kind of interesting how here's Judaism and where's Christianity it doesn't even exist. And all of a sudden, when Christ dies upon the cross, Christianity is born. And now what do we have? We have 2.5 billion people who believe in Jesus Christ. 14 million believe he didn't exist and are stuck in the Old Testament. Just it, it, it's just interesting stats, how we think we need to support whatever is going on over there. You know, oops, camera. Everybody at home sees the top hat, right? Okay, the guy's got hair. <laughs> Ephesians chapter. Okay, let's get back to Ephesians. Now, Ephesians is so important. What is it? it, it it's a book on love, and it's the love of Christ, and it's Jesus establishing the church. Chapter 2, 13 to 22. Oh, listen, to it's a lengthy reading, but it's a healthy reading. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You Gentiles, anybody that's not a Jew, you've been brought near. He himself is our peace who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. He took Jews and Gentiles and put us together. There is no Christians and Jews in this world. It's Jews and Gentiles put together is the thing that we need to understand. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is a law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, establishing peace, spiritual peace, and may right, might right reconcile them both in one body, the church, through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. He came, preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit, Jew, Gentile, everybody in the world who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior gets baptized for the forgiveness of their sins are added to the kingdom. And there is multiple congregations around this world. There is but one kingdom and there is but one people of god whatever else anybody is saying that's on them if you understand the new testament if you understand who christ is that's what it's teaching us by referring to this when you read you can understand my insight into the mystery of christ says paul chapter 3 verse 4 in verse 6 he says to be specific this is the mystery of christ gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body fellow partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. To me, verse 8, the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. We have all the, what, what's he saying? We have all the blessings, right? Chapter 1, verse 3 of Ephesians. Jesus Christ was blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We are so rich. Don't be looking at it on the physical. you got to stay on the spiritual. As soon as you get into the physical, you're going to get into big trouble. You're going to get depressed. You're going to get disappointed. Christ has set us free from all those foolish anxieties, which do a number on our health. Set yourself free from sin. Set yourself free from all the worries of this world by giving yourself to Christ. So that the manifold wisdom of God, verse 10, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a very important verse, verse 11. It's the eternal purpose. My favorite verse, it's, it's the easiest one to memorize. Genesis 00, 0 right? Genesis 00, 0 is when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came together together and designed the 
world. They wanted to create a world that they could put a man created in his image so that that man could spend eternity with. He's done it all for us. He's known it from the beginning. He's known the cross from the very beginning. And it's all to set you free to give you an eternal existence with God. That's the eternal plan. And the plan was to bring his son through the Jews into this world at the perfect time that Jesus would now unite the entire world. Everybody in this entire world is brought to this point. God wants all people to be saved. That's Christianity. That's the good news. And it's on a spiritual level. Romans chapter 8, verse 5, those who are according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh. But those according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. The world is at war. They're setting their mind on things of the flesh. Christians don't war that way. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God. If you stay in the physical level and that's where you, that's where you want to live, it's hostile towards God. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Jeff, last week, sermon talking about the heroes of Hebrews chapter 11. In that sermon, sermon pointed out that all of these Old Testament heroes all had their mistakes, all had their problems, but they were doing one or two things which are really great. And here I start the sermon this morning talking about Solomon, the greatest of the kings, maybe second to David, but the greatest of the kings. And he's such a loser in bringing everybody into idolatry. These guys had a relationship with God, but they kept making massive mistakes and they kept messing up. Why? Because they don't have what you have. Because Christ came to give us what we need. Not just forgiveness, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, I can't make it. I don't understand. I, I make big mistakes. He's in the back of my, my head. He lives within me. And he's encouraging me. Don't do it. Don't do it. Right. You know, but I'm going to do it. Right? Look at the scriptures. The spirit dwells within us. But do we listen to him lead us through the word? I don't hear voices. It's at this moment. <laughs> right. I'm getting old, but maybe I'll catch voices then. But I hear God speak to me through the word of God. Actually, I saw one meme the other day. The guy says, uh, I want God to speak to me. And his daughter says, read the Bible. No, I want God to speak to me out loud. Read it out loud. <laughs> right? Every time you read it, it's God talking to you. That's how real it is. And the spirit convicts us to that reality. We've got the spirit. Old Testament people didn't have the spirit. But because of his blood, that powerful, and we've been forgiven, and we've obeyed in the waters of baptism that we can have the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can make him jealous. You can put the fire out. But if you don't, you're going to live the life that God calls you to live. Christians, God's people, do not war physically, but we do war spiritually. I mean, John chapter 18, and so that's why I say when people are talking about these physical wars as being holy wars, they're crazy. John chapter 18, Pilate says, you know, who are you? What kind of king? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, of which we belong, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But it, as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. We are in a spiritual kingdom. 
We can't be fighting physically. Second Corinthians chapter 10. You can just write these down. I can send these notes out as well because I'm just sort of kind of. I did say we're going to do the armor of God, didn't I? Yeah, we'll get there. Verse 3, chapter 10, 2 Corinthians, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's the lies that are in this world that's what we're up against it's truth versus lies but the truth is what did he call it divinely powerful what is it romans chapter 1 verse 16 i'm not ashamed of the gospel it's the power of god for salvation this book is the power that you need to tap into load your hard drive so that you can use it not that you can Oh, well, just turn to Acts 2.38, you know. People don't want to hear you quote scripture. They want to see you live it. They want to see you explain Christ. And then, if they're interested, now we can take them to scripture and go through the scriptures with them. But as soon as you start quoting scripture, you know, oh yeah, Revelation yeah, chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 12, that's a really good one, you know, they're going to think you're whack. There's something wrong because you're, you know, where do you come from? They want to see it. The armor of God, Ch Ephesians chapter three. The thing to know, no, chapter six. The, the thing to know about the armor of God, every part has to do with the word. It's all about the word. That's the divinely powerful. So what's he saying? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In the strength of his might? Well, there's Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Put on the full armor of God every morning. Put on the full armor, because you don't put it on at night, okay? You go to sleep. Put it on in the morning, the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Well, I have a problem. The King James will say the wild of the devil and i'm saying schemes some say what tricks uh, strategy it's interesting how the greek word is methodio methodio does that sound very interesting because it's where we get the word method from it's his methods what's his methods genesis chapter 3 verse 1 indeed has god said what's his methods he lies we're, we're on to his lies. You need to be. I don't know every scheme or whatever, but I do know that lies are constantly coming at me. I need to be prepared to deal with the lies, the lies that this world is. I believe Satan is he's in free fall. He's in the he's in the pit. He's not demon possessing possessing people today. He doesn't need to. The world does a great job with all its possessions and all of its internet and all of that. People just surrender to such foolishness. No, no, he will be released judgment day or just prior to. It's the lies of this world that are killing us. I'm killing myself. How? Because I believe in the lies and I believe what the world's throwing at me but I've got to put on the armor of God to protect myself from the lies. And hopefully I can protect others from the lies. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Back to we're in a spiritual battle against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces. The rulers are the government, but we have to obey the government. Yes. You have to obey the government, except acts chapter four, verse 18 where the government of the land was the Sanhedrin as the, the Peter and John are standing before the Sanhedrin. And they're saying, you just quit talking about this guy's name, right? You cannot use Christ's name ever again. What do, they, what do they have to say to that one? You could probably quote it. I can't, I can't even find it. Acts 4, 18. It's someplace in 
They summoned them, commanded them not to speak or teach all at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. We cannot stop speaking about we have, what we have seen and heard. I have to obey the government unless it makes me sin. And I have to be able to tell what's a sin and what's not a sin. Have to pay them taxes. Well, I disagree with the taxes they're trying to, but I still have to pay the taxes. But I've got to watch out. I do not have to marry two guys. The government wants me to marry two guys. I don't have to marry two guys. It's a sin. Homosexuality is a sin. You can't say that. Yes, you can. Because it's coming out of the scriptures, right? The government enforces the lies. What's the other one? The, the that's the um, I'm sorry, that's the rulers, the powers, our battles against the power. Who's the powers? It's the media. The media advertises the lies. The media is the world we live in. You can't escape from it. I don't even think the Mennonites are able to escape from it. John chapter seventeen verse fifteen. What does Jesus say? To the Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil. Protect them from the evil. How does God protect us from the evil? He gives us the truth so we can identify the evil. You know, it's the it's the old story about the counterfeit. And then when the policeman is asked, how many counterfeits do you study so that you can spot it? He says, we don't study counterfeits. We study the true bill. Because once you know the true bill, all counterfeits fall short. You know what to look for. We don't need to study all the lies of this world. We, I don't need to study all the denominations. What I need to study is God's word. When somebody comes up and starts telling me about, oh, well, there's going to be a rapture. We're going to live here for a thousand years. I'm going, well, wait a second. Let's get back to God's word. See what God says about this right? Always be wary of these people who are teaching fear-mongering. If, if fear is, is thrown in there, there's a problem. You have to run from that. There is no fear. We do not have a spirit of timidity, but, but one of boldness, one of courage is what we need to understand. First John chapter 4, I'm turning to Peter. First John chapter four, verse one through verse three. When it comes to media, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. See whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. CNN, Fox, do they confess Christ? No, nah, I don't think so. Be wary of what you're listening to, what you're feeding on. You become what you feed on. If you've got the word, you can see through the lies of this world. Excuse me. I, it's amazing. We they're, they're constantly trying to get rid of the old books and bring in the new books. But one of the stories from the old books that I, I, I remember reading that they don't want the kids to have anymore is Chicken Little. The, the sky is falling. The sky is falling, right? It's the end of the world. It's the end of the world, right? They've been saying that for 50 years. They want you to be afraid. Don't listen to them. That's the media. And the last one here, the world forces, that's academia. The government enforces. The media advertises. Academia, universities, whatever. Academia comes up with the arguments for. Academia promotes it. And I say do it Daniel's way. If you want to get educated, I have nothing wrong with universities. But you have to do it the way Daniel took on the universities. Chapter 1, verse 8. He Daniel made up his mind. He would not defile himself with the king's choice food, wine, which he drank, 
He sought permission from the commander that he might not defile himself. Now, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of, of the officials. And when he was tested, verse 20, chapter 1, as for the matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Bendigo, he found them 10 times better than all the magician conjurers who were in his realm. What's Daniel chapter 1 say? Don't leave the word of God. Take God with you to the universities. Take God with you to the schools. But you're always checking the spirits. You're always making sure that you're in line with God and you're taking from the university that which could help you to be greater in the, in the kingdom, right? Too many kids go into university thinking they have the truth. They don't. But it's those three that you have to be wary of. You got to be wary of the government. You got to be wary of the media. Oh, yeah, he throws in one more, doesn't he? I, I'm happy with three, but he's got to make a four. The spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies. He's talking about me and guys like me. He's talking about preachers and teachers, right? The spiritual, what, what did he say again? The spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Because men will show up and men will want to teach their agenda. Men will want to teach. You have to do it. Back to the word. You can't just believe a teacher. You can't just believe a preacher. You can't just believe an elder. You have to be a Berean. You have to be a disciple of Christ. You have to check it out. Or else you're going to let that preacher or teacher go down the road of false teaching He'll destroy himself and destroy everybody that follows after him. But if you correct him, you ask him questions, you challenge him, then you can set him right. Men make mistakes. So if you think what I'm saying is crazy, then challenge me. Because probably it is. Hopefully it isn't. But then iron sharpens iron and we can correct one another. That's what makes the church strong. A denomination, they're not into the word. They're into jump up and down, sing and, 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 and shout and roll around on the floor, whatever they do, right? No, we have to be disciples of Christ. You have to be. In, so the point about all of this armor of God's, it's all about you getting grounded in the word. Therefore, seven pieces of armor. The, take up the full armor, armor of God so that you can resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. If you know the truth, you can stand firm. So therefore, put on the, the belt of truth. What, what is that? That's that's John chapter 8, 31, 32. Abide in my word. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. You got to believe that the Bible is the truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Now, this is kind of interesting. What is righteousness? Righteousness is nothing more than obeying the truth. In, in, in Revelation, no, Revelation, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. What's he saying? Let me capture it. Do you not know when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience? You're slaves to the one whom you obey, either resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. My righteousness is obeying God's word. That's the breastplate of righteousness. Now the people can't accuse me. You have to practice what you preach. The sandals of the gospel of peace. The question you need to ask yourself is, am I prepared to share? I got to be prepared to share something with somebody. I'm not just here for myself. I'm here to help others. The shield of faith, which will shield, will protect me from the darts of the evil people from the, and it's not the evil one. If you look in your Bibles, it'll say evil one, but the one is in italics because it's not there. It's just evil. What is evil? Evil is the lies. Second Peter chapter three, verse three. Know this, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mark, mocking, following after their own lust, saying, where's the promise? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues as it was from the beginning of creation. When they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. Earth was formed out of water and by water. 
through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. What's he talking about? He's talking about creation. That God brought the dry land out of the water and he destroyed everything with what? The flood. But the world's mocking. They're teaching evolutionary theory. They don't teach creation. You got to know the word of God to protect yourself from getting caught up in evolutionary theory. That's the shield of faith. The helmet of salvation. First John chapter five, verse 13. I write these things, the word of God. I write these things, says John, so you can know that what? You have, you have present tense eternal life. That's the helmet of salvation. You don't have to worry about what people say. And then the sword of the spirit, that's the word of God. And doing what? Always praying on our behalf. When you pray, you're getting the marching orders from the commander. There's the seven pieces of the armor of God. And every one is connected to the word of God, which shows the importance of the word of God. If people knew the word of God, they wouldn't be fretting over this foolishness called holy wars and things that are going on. The war on that, on a video the other day, it was a young girl and it was a bobcat. I don't know if you saw it. And she's got this really neat shield, right? And she's got the bobcat and she just, she pushes him right to the end of the, because he's, he's caught in a leg hole trap. And she pushes him right to the end of the chain and then lifts the shield and puts it right over on his leg. And then holding that really tight, careful, because he's just, he's going crazy. She releases the leg hole trap. And then she lets his leg go and then she just backs up. And now she's got this wild bobcat. But he licks his leg. And he just looks at her with this contempt, right? That's what Christianity is about. We're trying to release people from the lies that they're caught in, the leg hole traps. They're not happy what you're going to try to do. But we've got the shield of faith. And they're going to throw everything at us. But we've got the sword which, of the spirit, which is the word of God. And what we're trying to do is reach around. All we're trying to do is cut them free from all those lies. Just cut them free. Cut them free. It's a dangerous job. That's no, not dangerous. you got God with you. But if you can set them free, they are going to be forever grateful. And you're going to have one a brother or a sister. You can keep them off in a distance, keep them as enemies. Or you could take the time and spend and try to help set them free. That's what Paul says for us to do. And I'll leave it at that. Second Timothy chapter 2, 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. You can't win an argument when you're talking to people. You just got to pour on the love. Not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. That's what God calls us to do. The armor is to protect us from the world. The armor is to protect us when we're in battle, one-on-one -on -one with individuals, trying to help set them free. They're not going to like it at first, but as you cut away the lies, compassion starts to flow. Question, the, the thing Jesus calls us to be is what? We're, we're called to be peacemakers. Why? They shall be called sons of God. Put on the armor of God and be the peacemaker this week and see what happens. That's my encouragement.